Well, I am a South Florida orange turned Georgia peach <laughs> by way of my <laughs> dad school. Um, came up, came here a little over two to three years ago. Um, and there is a campus in Miami, but um, I found that when we're in our comfort zones, you know, we don't really get to push ourselves and grind. So I'm chasing the grind. I'm chasing the hustle. I'm trying to always make myself better. So I'm like, you know, if you can not trying to steal the phrase from New York, but if you can make it in Georgia, you can kind of make it anywhere. Cause that's kind of what it's turning <laughs> into. Um, so yeah, a little bit about that. Um, yeah, I'm just excited to be here. So happy to be in school. So happy to be doing something that I've found that I really, really enjoy. It's like a finding 30 degree water in 110 degree desert. So it's amazing. I love that. Amazing. Talk to me about what you love in advertising. What are you seeing out there? What are some of your favorite brands and, um, and, uh, and campaigns? What, do you, what, what are you a fan of? One woman's point of view. Oh my gosh. Uh, um, so currently at this time, number one reason why I love advertising is because um, just like Shane was saying, like it is literally when you think about how mass media is controlled by necessarily one group of people think, you have some serious power in your hands right there. Um, our jobs are that much as important as like a brain surgeon or the police, if you will. Um, one of my favorite campaigns that still blows my mind to this day is that when Burger King put together something on an app, um, they did a geo test where they were sending everyone to McDonald's to get a Whopper. Hmm. I'll just let that sink it. Like that, that's crazy. Like you, me, Andrea, we're probably not going to do that, but just, I would do that. <laughs> I'm interested. I thought that was brilliant. I would do that. Yeah. Free, listen, I, I came from zero. Free is always interesting. But the, yeah. spoof, the spoof of it, I'm like, yeah, it was clever. On. You know what I'm saying? So that when you think about that, like, Clorox had to release a statement because a certain someone told everybody, you know, and, and you know, everybody knows that. So um, just the power and the responsibility that we have. And I just love it because you're able to professionally play. You're a professional creator. Um, we're, we're mixing up content and we're getting right now in today's age, a diverse group of people to come in because we have a diverse group of people that live in America and all across the world. Everybody is in one color. Um, so that's number two, of course, what I love about advertising. Um, and some people that are really surprising me right now, Ben and Jerry's, I mean, they're knocking it out of the ballpark. Um, they wasted no time in their window space. But someone who is really impressing me right now is actually babies.com, babynames.com. Only because I went on there and I saw a campaign that they did um, off of Ad Age. I think they highlighted it where everyone that has been affected um, and murdered um, by the hands of police brutality they basically put the campaign there and listed all of their names. Now that's not even, that's just what we know is publicized, but they listed all of their names now and they basically saw this is, these people were, and it, the, the words and everything resonated so deep because when you're going to find a baby name, you don't expect to see, you know, a name like George Florida, Eric Garner there, but you're, you're gonna remember that they were people as well. And you know, we're, we're trying to go ahead and change that narrative right now. So yeah, that's what I love about it. Love Shane? After you walk across the stage this fall, you're entering the professional workforce. What inspires you and what petrifies you about that prospect? Uh, I'm gonna start with the petrify. So what I would say that makes me kind of scared is that it's not about the pandemic um, because right now is where lines are being drawn in the sand and you're able to discover who's really in this industry. It separates the men from the boys, if you will. Mm. Um, and so I, I would, I'm really scared about, you know, everyone basically saying like hire more black people and that's great. I want, you know, people to hire <laughs> more persons of color, but I don't want it to just be something where we're just filling a quota. So no one doesn't look at our agency and it's like, Oh, I don't see a lot of, that's right. You know, I don't, I don't want it to be like a roundup and we're just hiring y'all to hire. No, I want you to take us through the process. Um, creative directors should be cultivating right now. You, you should know the ins and outs about your team. Like if you're a creative director right now, your main job is to make sure that your agency is number one in the world. And how are you going to do that? It's the people that you're working with. Like you leave from the back, not the front. So I think that's what I'm kind of nervous about right now coming into the industry. I don't want to just be a quota. I want my fair shake and I want everyone to, uh, you know, really cultivate the new, the new that's coming in um, and just making sure that you're building authentic relationships and really getting the best out of people that you're trying to bring on your team. 
Asia, what's really um, super powerful about that is we have a volume model at VaynerMedia that we think is completely merit-based, yeah. right? I don't want the subjective opinion of a creative director deciding you're good enough or you're not good enough based on your Miami ad school is an unbelievable as that education is for the ad world. Yeah. I, what, what I'm so excited about now is in a digital world that we believe in where you can put out content at scale down here and let the market show you. Yep. What were, you know, all of a sudden you're taking girl, boy, black, white, you know, Asian, Muslim, like all those variables out, the market's deciding, not the internal system yep. that has subjectivity, whether something heavy, like we're talking about here, or, oh, I didn't think that was a funny line that you wrote for an yep. ad, has always had its vulnerabilities. And I'm, you know, I think a lot about what we're doing as an agency and what we're trying to set up which is building a merit-based ecosystem around creativity that I think is gonna service exactly what you're saying right now. Exactly, Gary, because it comes down to the systematic issue, not only in the advertising industry, you're talking about a systematic issue that's been placed, you know, just in, in America and the world period. And for us, in order for us to move forward, it's almost like teaching a child that two plus two is three instead of four. And it's just, everybody's just gonna keep passing down that information. Well, that's wrong. We have to change the system and change the process in order to go ahead and move forward. So it's almost like you got to back up and go to reverse and then, you know, kind of corner that thing out of there, you know? So. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. What about for you? You said your favorite thing is ideation. Like, is it just a thrill to be like, all right, do you like the problems? Like for me, I, I think I like marketing because I'm a oper like I like operating things. So for yeah. me, it's actually just a problem. It's like, I have to say something in some way that's gonna make this thing happen. Do you yeah. like that challenge or are you more aesthetic? Because I'm, I'm less aesthetic, to be honest. I'm, I'm more of like the problem part more than like, ooh, this green is gonna make it happen. I don't yeah. have that, say, how about for you? I think, um, I think that I like the whole formula of it. Um, I hate math, let me not say that. I love math because dollars are math, but I, when you go down to like a problem solving thing, um, I think I like the formula, how you get to the end of a solution and really see something um, come to fruition. So I love the moments where you have you and three other people in a room and y'all are locking y'all stuff in the room and y'all are just bouncing ideas off of the wall. That's where the magic happens right there. That's what I love. And then solidifying that and combining all of our energies together to say, we've really gone through this formula to make sure that this is the answer or one of the answers, let's formulate maybe two or three and then go ahead and execute that. So I think I, I really like the process of getting to find the answer. And then once you found it, it's like that eureka moment, you're, uh, you're kind of, you know, just taking it and get to the answer. I love problem solving because, you know, what are you in the industry for if you're not basically doing that? But it's, it's not just the aesthetic for me because, you know, I'm a designer at heart. Like the aesthetic has to go with it to bring the whole package together. Um, but I think it's, it's really the grind of it, the, the concepting and really solidifying what, what the actual insight is to making sure that you're hitting every mark and that's gonna bring you that beautiful answer. Shane? Asia, how, how has COVID shaped creativity and design? I think again, it has separated, if you thought you were creating before and then you felt that COVID came into the way and kind of messed that up, you weren't creating before. I think that when you're, uh, you're coming into the mix and you're, you know, you're saying that you want to enter this industry and really do it, um, you have to immerse yourself into it. Um, I think that COVID has really challenged those creatives um, and really brought out a lot of creative leaders to the forefront um, so we can think about a new day because that's what we're basically on right now. Like the new fashion trend is a mask. <laughs> and shame on you if you don't have it. It's almost like, you know, you can, you can not wear underwear in public, but you have to wear your mask in public now. So I think that it, it's forcing people or um, igniting real creatives to go out there and really challenge themselves about the new day that we're in right now. So I'm very optimistic about COVID. It's unfortunate, you know, that certain things happen while we're in the process of a pandemic. Um, but I just believe like as we're in evolution, uh, we just got caught you know, kind of like the wildfire burns and new life comes. I think we got caught into that. And this is gonna be the process of something beautiful that comes out of COVID and, and the pandemic as a whole. We're realizing what's really important right now. 
Asia, do you feel like you're, were you raised to be optimistic? You know, you're, ta- like, you're talking right now, I'm like, I love this. Like, this is, that's my framework, right? That's the luxury of my DNA and my en- yeah. environment. Like, do you feel like, I mean, that was an optimist, practical optimistic statement, which is genuinely my favorite. So yeah. I'm fired up right now. Do you feel like that was DNA? Do you think that was, you know, were you raised in an environment that you, that put optimism on a pedestal? It's a, you know, it's very tough. I, I've also walked very, you know, you delivered that with such class. I've yeah. walked very fine lines of like, people have died from COVID. And, but, but I, my brain goes to, if COVID started two months earlier, Kobe Bryant doesn't die. If COVID happened during this time a year ago, my great friend Nipsey Hussle would be alive. Yep. I go to looking at the, this is Shane, you like this on big data. I look at the traffic data and see how many lives were saved from accidents, car accidents during this time because everyone was home. It's kind of hard to be an optimist in the face of something like this. Global you- warming. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We only have one planet. Um, I think that, um, I, w- I would say, of course, I was raised to be optimistic. Every child has their challenges um, and negativity, but I think my mom um, and my grandmother um, and just my family, close cousins and things like that, and friends, best friends, um, they kept me uh, encouraged. Um, life isn't easy for anyone, um, but I just think that my mom waking up every day telling me and pouring into her kids, like, you know, you guys are leaders. You guys are the head, not the tail. Y'all are above and not beneath. Um, you know, you go out there and you do your best and that's all I ask you to do. Um, I ask you to just be an amazing human being and just, you you know, my mom really taught us that whatever you put out, you're going to get that back. As my grandma Reba says, you know, practice makes perfect. And so if you're, if you're striving every day to make sure that your practice, you're, you're getting ready to run and make sure it's a perfect stride, um, that's going to already, already, you know, kind of be embedded in you. Um, of course, I've had my trials and different things like that, but I think that uh, you put less stress on yourself when you kind of, you know, just put that positivity thing out there. You know this, Gary. I listen to you every morning. Like, come on. I love you. But, you know, it, you, you... But it's... it's but it's... Pr- but it's... But it's pr- what's amazing is, it's you know, to me, the pride I have when I'm an old man and explaining, I'm like, I think it's practical positivity, right? Like, yep. like I'm not delusional. I yeah. love when people, you know, people like, I'm keeping it real. I'm like, you're not fucking keeping it real. You're keeping yeah. it cynical. Yeah. You're keeping it negative, you yeah. know? And I think that there's a fine, you know, that to me is in the way that you described it. It's what I jumped on. I'm like, oh, this is my, this is my sister right here. Like you went with a practical optimism, not the secret where you're like, oh, it's all going to work. I mean, I, you know, I'm yeah. sure Shane saw this coming up. You know, everybody asked him, how do I get in? They're like, I hope to be in the NBA. You're like, did you take a thousand free throws? Are you running? Yeah, you know, you know? I mean, like people great. are hoping out here. Six foot five. That's great that you're six foot five, but are you willing to put in the work it's, every it's, day? It's, it's back to privilege. It's yep. great that you're a white male, but I fucking work my fucking face off. It's great yep. that you're six eight. I know unlimited six eight that haven't done shit. Period. Drops Period. the mic. You said it, Gary. Same. <laughs> so totally, but, yeah. So so paint what success looks like. Where you stand now? How how we how will you know? You know what? I did it. So. I'm going to give you two answers and they're both going to be the right answers. Um, I'm going to give you my Gary V, Kanye West, like Beyonce answer. And then I'm going to give you still that, that genuine answer um, that's really ha- heartfelt because I think that people need to hear both. So the heartfelt thing is that technically I've already, I'm already successful because I'm doing what I love. Um, I wake up every day and I do what I love. If you look at the United States of America about I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really throw a large number. 95% of the people wake up and don't like what they do every day. They don't like, they dread getting up and going to a place where they don't really want to be. Um, and that's going into some Bob Proctor stuff. I'll talk to Gary and Andre about that. But <laughs> when you, you know, I, I, I'm successful because I wake up every day and I'm like, I can't believe that I'm about to, I'm a creative professional. I'm just speaking it over myself. I, I am. I'm about to go in this industry with, um, you know, with the fire behind me and, and I'm just so lucky. And then it's the other answer where you're successful um, by the things that you do. If you're immersing yourself in whatever you want to be good at, you have to make sure you're reading, you have to make sure you're studying, you have to make sure you're getting a mentor, you have to make sure you're following, you're YouTubing, you're TikToking. So it doesn't matter if you want to be the next Michael Phelps. Are you going to the pool every day? Are you working Facts. out? Facts. You working Tell- out every day? You're eating right? You're, you're watching your body fat and trying to equate that to how fast you can move in the water. Like, 
you got to know your science about what you want to be in. So um, I, I think those things either equal up success and then um, I'm already successful. I, I just can't wait to, to go into the next phase of- uh, Andrea, of Andrea, Andrea if, if, we're not, if, if you're not recruiting this young lady, even though you're the greatest CMO ever, you, your job may be in jeopardy. <laughs> oh, no. I love it, we gotta go.